How you doing guys? Welcome to another video. This is 18.3 pH curves. Let's go. Okay, so volume 10, what are pH curves? We look at the general shapes of pH curves. We talk about selecting an indicator and then we look at salt pH. The IB understandings and applications talk about being able to recognize or draw one of the three pH curves and also to identify some important parts of the graph. We also look at salts and the pH that different salts may have when dissolved in water. So the first type of reaction for a pH curve that we need to know is a strong acid versus a strong base. Hydrochloric versus sodium hydroxide. After the reaction, we'll only have sodium ions, chloride ions, and water left in the solution. Because sodium ions and chloride ions, they don't have any acid or base properties, that means the equivalence point will have a pH at 7. So we're looking for the exact mole ratios to react and form a solution that has a pH of 7. And the pH curve looks a bit like the one on the right hand side there. Now we would assume that we've added base to acid because we've started with a low pH, so that means that our acid must be in our conical flask. And from the y-intercept, we could determine the concentration of that acid by working out the P from the pH. 10 to the negative pH gives us our concentration of acid. The inflection point is known as the equivalence point, and that's where the number of moles of the acid and the base are in their exact stoichiometric proportions, so where they exactly react. Also from this graph we could work out the volume of the base added by looking at where that equivalence point occurs and then going down to the x-axis to find the volume. We could also start with a base in our conical flask and the pH curve will just look a little bit different going from a high pH to a low pH. The equivalence point will still be in the same location because it's still a weak, a strong acid versus a strong base. But this time when we find the concentration, we'd have to find the concentration of OH- ions. So be a little bit careful with that. We could also work out the volume of acid added by looking at where the equivalence point occurs and then going down to the x-axis to determine the volume. The pH curves continue in that shape because we would want to add excess acid just to show the general shape of the curve. Okay, well what if we have a strong acid versus a weak base? So something like hydrochloric acid versus ammonia. Ammonia is a weak base. At the end of the reaction or the completion, we'll have some ammonium ions in the solution. Now ammonium is a weakly acidic substance, which means that the pH of the solution would be below 7. So our equivalence point is said to be somewhere between about 3 and 5 in terms of pH. So a strong acid versus a strong base has an equivalence point between 3 and 7. So if we assume that we have an acid in our conical flask, it's going to start with a very low pH, and then as we start to add our base, the solution is going to change pH very steadily until it reaches its equivalence point and then it will change quite sharply. But this time the equivalence point will be somewhere around 5.5, somewhere between 3 and 7. Exactly where it is depends on the reactants that we use. Some of the important parts of the graph. The y-intercept, again, we could find our hydrogen ion concentration. The pH is the, at the equivalence point, the inflection point of the graph, and here I'm saying it's about 5.5. And between those two regions, we have what is called the buffer region. This is where the pH changes gradually over a period of time. Now, a buffer contains a base and some of the conjugate acid. So that means that in this case, in that buffer region, we have both a conjugate acid and the conjugate base in the solution. So that's why the pH change is very gradual over that short period. Now we could work out how much volume of base was needed to neutralize the acid by looking at the inflection point and working out the volume. Now at half of that volume, at say 10 centimeters cubed, we have what's known as the half equivalence point. That's when exactly half of the acid has been neutralized by the base. So it's a half neutralized reaction. Now in this buffer region, this part of the buffer region, this is where we have the pH 
which is equal to the pKa. So that is a section of the graph that they ask you to know. And if you are asked to calculate the pH at the half neutralization point, it's the pKa of the weak acid. If we have a strong base versus a weak acid, consider we have ethanoic acid versus sodium hydroxide, then at the end of the reaction we have some ethanoate ions in the solution. Now those ethanoate ions, they're a weak base, so they could accept a proton, which means the equivalence point is going to be above 7. So for a strong base versus a weak acid, we have an equivalence point somewhere between what we say about 8 and 10, or 7 and 10, somewhere around there. And then we can draw the graph showing that our pH starts off a bit higher because we have a weak acid in the solution. And then as we add the base, our equivalence point is higher. Again, somewhere between 7 and 11, depending upon the compounds. We have the concentration of H plus initially in the flask. We could identify our equivalence point from the inflection point of the graph. Here we're saying that it's around 8.5. We can identify the buffer region as the section between the initial starting point, the y-intercept, and the equivalence point. In this case, our buffer would consist of our acid and its conjugate base. And remember, at the half equivalence point, we would have half of the acid neutralized, so our pH will be equal to our pKa value. All right, let's have a quick chat about acids and base indicators. Now, indicators are usually weak acids. That is, they act as acids or and weak bases according to Le Chatelier's principle. So if we add in some H plus to the situation above, Le Chatelier's principle says that the addition of H plus is going to want to shift to the left to partially oppose that increase in H plus. So what that means is that HIN would be favoured in the solution. So the concentration of HIN would be greater than the concentration of IN minus, and we would have that particular colour. In a basic solution, well, if we add in OH minus, that's going to shift it to the right, so our concentration of IN minus would be greater than our concentration of HIN. Essentially, an indicator just tells you the colour, which is corresponds to the ratio between HIN, which is colour 1, and IN minus, which is colour 2. The midpoint of the indicator is where the HIN equals I N minus, and that's the point at which we say the color changes. So for example, if we take something like methyl red, methyl red is red in an acidic solution and yellow in a basic solution, and it's pKa equals 5.5. So we say that its color change occurs at about 5.5. So at a pKa of 5.5, the color of HIN is equal to the color of I N minus, and we would see an orange solution. As soon as we go above 5.5, we'll have more yellow in the solution, so it's going to start to appear lighter. If we were adding more acid, it would start to appear more red. So if we're asked to choose an indicator, we need to make sure that we signal the, the end point very close to the equivalence point. We'll never get it exactly the same, but we must select an indicator that changes colour closest to the equivalence point. So here we have a reaction between an acid and a base. From the graph, I can see that that is a strong acid versus a strong base. The equivalence point is at a pH of 7. Now, if we were asked to choose an indicator, and there's a list on the right-hand side, which is the data book from the data book, what we can do is just go in and have a look at the ranges of these different indicators and work out which one best suits our situation. So here we have phenylphthalein, bromomethyl blue, and methyl orange. From the graph, we can see that bromomethyl blue is the closest to the equivalence point. So it is probably the best indicator for this situation. We also have phenylphthalein, which is also very close to the equivalence point. So that one would probably work as well. We would see the color change going from colorless to pink. What we can do, and the reason why that works, is if we were to determine the volume that we added, 
For bromomethyl blue and phenylphthalein, the volume difference is very, very small, which is why those two indicators would be said to give us a good indication of the equivalence point. From the graph that I've drawn, methyl orange would actually change colour too early and we would stop the titration too early. There's still quite a big difference in volume between the equivalence point and the end point of that indicator. One of the things that we can be careful of is that the colour change is considered to happen over a range of pKa plus or minus 0.1. So we've got a bit of leeway there as well. The final thing for this volume is to determine whether or not a salt is acidic, basic or neutral based upon um, its reaction with water. Now an important concept here is that group 1 hydroxides are said to be strong bases except for calcium hydroxide. Calcium hydroxide is considered a weak base because it doesn't fully dissociate. So the way we do that if we're given a salt is we pretend that we add it to water and it dissociates and then we write the equation for water self-ionizing as well. So here we have KNO3 ionizing to K plus and NO3 minus, and we also have water ionizing to H plus and OH minus. Now you can see just by writing them in, an, in a smart way that KOH, well that's a strong acid, and HNO3, that's a strong base. So we've got a strong acid and a strong base that have formed in that have been used to form KNO3, so that will be a neutral salt. CaNO3, calcium nitrate, would dissociate into calcium ions and nitrate ions. If we include the self-ionization of water, we would form H3O, H3O plus or H plus and OH minus. Now from the little bit of information above, we said that calcium hydroxide is not considered to be a strong base. It's considered to be a weak base. HNO3 is a strong acid. So here we have a case of a strong acid versus a weak base, so that will be slightly acidic. For the third one, we have the sodium methan methanoate. Sodium methanoate, it would dissolve in water to form the methanoate ion and a sodium ion. Again, if we put in the self-ionization of water, we could form methanoic acid and sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide is a strong base, Methanoic acid is a weak acid, so we have a weak acid and a strong base, which would make this solution basic. For the final one, we have ammonium ethanoate. Now, ammonium ethanoate will dissociate into ethanoate ions and ammonium ions, and then if we add in the self-ionization of water, we'll have the H2O going to methanoic, ethanoic acid, and then we would also form some ammonium hydroxide. Now, what will happen here is we've essentially got a weak acid and a weak base. Two weak acid, a weak acid, weak base. That means that this will be approximately neutral. In fact, we'd have to have a look at the Ka and pKa and pKb values to work that one out. Okay, volume 10, some top tips. Make sure you identify what type of reaction it is from the graph, refer to the data booklet for the indicators, and then think about what it's made from for, for the salts. Thanks for watching, guys. Don't forget, drop a like on the video, subscribe for more, and I'll see you.